From the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Platteville, this is the Proud Rural Teacher Podcast, and I'm your host, Jessica Brogley. Support for this podcast comes from the Rural Schools Collaborative, a national nonprofit committed to strengthening the bonds between schools and communities. Funding is part of the collaborative's I Am a Rural Teacher campaign. You can learn more about RSC online at ruralschoolscollaborative.org. Today's podcast episode takes you on a journey to Potosi, Wisconsin, where you'll meet a group of both students and adults, all dedicated to three missions, all of which benefit the school system and the community. Potosi is a rural community with a long history going back to the early 1800s. And for this entire episode, we are on location in the downtown area of Potosi. It's mid-February, and the temps are really nice, but there's still snow on the ground. Potosi Main Street is about three miles long and a gradual slope downhill towards the Mississippi River. To me, Potosi represents the landscape of the Driftless in that the Main Street seems nestled in a hollow, with homes and businesses tucked up against the rock. It's definitely representative of what we think of as the Driftless landscape. We start out at the Badger Hut Trails to learn how students are partnering with community members to improve this historically relevant trail that offers yet another destination stop for visitors to the area. On this walk, you'll meet Superintendent Kurt Cohn, science teacher Matt Eastlick, member of the Potosi Downtown Revitalization Committee, Larry Kalina, and students Logan Apanaugh, Connor McKillop, Emily Bierman, Logan Cruiser, and Ethan Kirkhoff. You're learning about three projects today. One, how students are learning about concepts in science while improving their community by working on the Badger Hut Trail. And two, how students will be supporting the creation of the Potosi Driftless Information Center in downtown Potosi. And lastly, how students are helping install a prairie on school property. Let's start out at the bottom of the Badger Trail Huts. Take a walk with us. All right, so do we want to start off before we start walking who you are in the district? Like, what do you do? Who are you and what do you do? Okay. In the community or district. Yeah. And who are you? So, I'm Matt Eastlick, and then I, I teach uh, middle school and high school life science classes. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I also am the environmental club advisor. And I do a little coaching with football as well. So that's my primary role. All right. I'm Larry Kalina, uh, community volunteer. And I'm also on a committee that's trying to uh, revive our downtown area. You know, we're starting a Driftless Information Center. I'm Kurt Cohen, District Administrator. Uh, one of our stated goals for the year for, for our staff and, and students alike is to reach back out to the community, reconnect after uh, a couple years of pandemic where unfortunately our community hasn't been able to be a big part of our school to to physically come to our building. So this is a, a big part of what we're trying to emphasize this year. All right, and our students. I'm Connor McKillop, and I'm a senior, and I'm here to talk about, you know, the trails and all that. And I'm a member of Mr. Eastlick's Environmental Club. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm Logan. Be... I'm Logan Uppenau, and I'm also a member of Mr. East, Mr. Eastlick's Environmental Club, and I'm a senior at Potosi High School, and I'm here to talk about the prairie that he's been working on for the past year. Well, I'm Emily Bierman, and I'm a junior, and I'm in the environmental club. I'm Logan Cruiser. I'm a junior at Potosi, and I'm in the environmental club, and I'm just here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ethan Kirkhoff. I'm a junior at Potosi, and uh, I'm the vice president of the Envir- environmental club. Okay. Soon to be president. <laughs> <laughs> so what, uh, what are we doing here? Let's talk about that first. What's the significance of this particular location? Uh, well, this is just a location where uh, history has it has um, happened where people used to come here and mine on the top of these little bluffs, and so they create a little trail that kind of um, 
we can actually see the old badger huts of where they used to live during the summer when they stayed here. And so people in Potosi have kept that going for a lot of years. And so as the environmental club, uh, a few years ago, Jackie Brandt reached out and said, can, getting older in age and can't really keep the trail up to date. So that's something that we've kind of volunteered to help maintain the trail, getting stuff off the trail. So that's kind of our role that, that's been. And now we're kind of looking at adding some new signs and some new informational stuff on the trail. And that's what these guys have been doing a little bit of work with that just recently, putting together some of that informational stuff for the trail. Right. Did I miss anything, Larry? That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Should we head up the trail? Sure. All right, let's. <laughs> So that was Matt Eastlick. He's one of the science teachers for the district uh, and a UW Plavo graduate. Got to slip that in there. Uh, and he's also the environmental club advisor. Really helps you. And then Jackie Brandt's done a lot of the work to kind of actually has a little brochure that she's used over the years that kind of has uh, 20 different trees species along the trail that you mm -hmm. can uh, identify. She's got, has had numbers on them. Some of the trees have died. So that's kind of part of the trail too. There's just some um, science kind of stuff. She used to be a science teacher down in Dubuque. So what does she do now? She's retired. Oh, retired teacher. She, gotcha. Her and her husband uh, still live here in Potosi. Mm -hmm. She's part of the historical. Yes. Yeah. What's it? Historical She's society. She's part of the historical society. So the plan would be that the students maintain it, but the public can come yeah, see it. Yeah. The news they have been it's been available for mm -hmm. a number of years, but we're just kind of using some of the younger people to. Yeah. Do the maintenance. Do the hard work. Well, and they also gain that connection to why Potosi is so cool, right? Yeah. Why it's important. Hey, Connor, you want to talk about this here? The dam? Oh, uh, yeah. So I don't the, know if you can see it there or not. But. Yeah. yeah. So these dams, they were built kind of to um, leading into the valley, so Potosi really it wouldn't flood because they were unmortared, so water would seep through little by little every time. Um, which would prevent the flooding, you know, from water just stacking up over time. It's so, called a check dam? Yeah, yeah, a check dam. So how old is that? Well, they were built in 1940s. Oh, okay. 40s. Yeah. In 1940s. I'm pretty sure. I we can go check. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Very cool. I don't know if there's other ones in... Uh, yeah, there are several in the village. There are, okay. Because of the hills. Um, and the, by Three Mile Main Street, you can tell the water by the time it goes down to the bottom. It's, 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 yeah. That's why they built. So that slows down potential flooding. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. I think they were built when President Roosevelt was, he had the sea, sea camps yeah. in the Depression. Oh, interesting. That's how you, that's how you get people working. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the voice of Larry Kalina. He's part of the Potosi Downtown Revitalization Committee. He's definitely a knowledgeable and uh, inspiring collaborative spirit for the students and school district. So we're walking up this hill, and on the right, we'll get to an old historic cemetery just above the check dam. It's pretty great. The kids will tell you a little bit about it. Yeah, the old Irish cemetery. Yes. Just read up down here. Where's Connor? All right, I'm here to talk about the cemetery. So this cemetery basically formed 1930s, like when the St. Andrew Parish kind of formed this was here. And we find out that two Civil War veterans are actually buried here, which is kind of interesting. And actually there's a pine tree, I don't know where it is, but that big one, it's said to be the oldest east of the Mississippi River. So yeah. The oldest pine tree? Yeah, it's approximately Huge. 212 years old. That's what Jackie O'Brien always said. Mm -hmm. And uh, Larry and I, this is, was it this summer or fall? I think it was this fall. Mm -hmm. We kind of came up and measured around the, the circumference and did the old um, calculations there's, there's to kind of figure out. Next. I think it's 133 inches around. Actually, yeah. I actually have the paper here with me. Oh, so sure. I can, see it. I can give you this. Right there. 
so. That's assuming it's a white pine, yeah. you said, right? It's a white pine. White pine, mm -hmm. 133 inches circumference, and its diameter is 42 inches. So it should be 212 years yeah. old, and approximately. There's a growth index for white pine. Wow. That, yeah. That's just approximate age. It, that's the tree right there. That, the tree was used a lot for lumber years ago in the United States. And it's fair to say that, uh, I mean, it's a small cemetery, but there are Potosi ancestors, yeah. right, that are buried here. Way back when, Potosi was an Irish community, and Tennyson was a German community. So this was the Irish cemetery way back yeah. when. And there are some Civil War people that are buried there. Wow. I think you can't see right now, but they have a kind of an indicator that were Civil War veterans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, I was going to have these guys. So we're going to put a type of put a bird sign right here. Uh, that's about you know yay big. What was, what was the dimensions? I can't remember exactly. Um, Thirty was, inches by was, oh, forty, I think. Something like that. Mm -hmm. What's going to be here? Yeah, the bird sign with like 21 different birds on it that you can find out here and like what they do, like what kind of nests they make and like how you can find them, like what like their behavior is to be able to like identify them mm -hmm. and just like pictures of them it's, like so you know what they are. It seems like this forest has diversity within it between inhabitants and species of trees or right? Yeah. And so what will your role be in this? Um, making this, like making the, like the, like the pictures and all the information, putting all the information on the sign. Got much. it. Right. And then some of the birds are like what you'd see in the winter. Yeah, like so they're not all, you know, birds that you would, all the possible birds, just birds you could see that are like predatory birds, some of those, like Cooper's hawks, things like that. And then also like owls. juncos, owls, and obviously Sounds. cardinals. Hopefully things that people would see almost mm -hmm. certainly, at least one of them would mm -hmm. be the goal. Because there's a lot of people that actually go looking for birds, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like a, a hobby of theirs. So we kind of want to, we thought, we, we, as Larry and I were talking about, we thought it'd be better to have a bird sign than just a wildlife sign because you don't always see mammals. It's kind of hard to, like we saw a deer mm -hmm. here today, but that's not always the case. So. The tracks were... Yeah, lots Wonderful. Of so that was awesome. Ethan right. talking about how students are helping make informational kiosks along the trail. As we kept climbing upward, we paused and looked to the left and saw the remnants of badger huts. I had never seen one in person before, so I really didn't recognize what I was looking at. If you're from the Midwest, you know that Wisconsin is known as the Badger State, and it's not because of Bucky Badger. <laughs> uh, our early miners, when they arrived here, uh, especially if it were in the winter, didn't have the tools or the ability or the resources to build, say, a cabin. Instead, they lived in, oh, they're not even caves, really, um, <laughs> cutouts in the side of a hill, and they might um, block them up with rock or brush, very, very crude places to call home. But that's where they got their start, in badger huts. They dug a hole like a badger. And so on this trail, you're going to be able to see the remnants of a badger hut. My only request is that you stay on the trail and leave the huts intact. Um, it's a remarkable right, thing to see. This because people listening to this won't be from southwest Wisconsin, <laughs> perhaps. What's a badger hut? Well, badger hut's basically, so the, there was a treaty back in the 1820s between the Indians and the federal government. Basically, that's what started the lead rush, bringing in the miners. And they built these um, badger huts to live here over the summer when they mined. So they only lived here, you know, during that short amount of time. So they just needed something um, short and temporary. And basically, that's what they built is these, these badger huts. I mean, they weren't really nothing special. It was just kind of something small to live in a couple months. So I'm just seeing like a fortress of rock and, and yep. moss. Was this it? Was there a roof? Was there walls? So keep in mind now, 1827 is when the government opened itself for lead mining. 
So these are probably well over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And we think that they were originally covered. And of course, what direction do they face? South. Away from that, yeah. Yeah. So this is the, but we think this might be the only badger hut, original one that we know of in southwest Wisconsin. Wow. Um, go ahead, how far does it is it does it go down at all? Um, when that's melted, what's inside? Yeah, yeah, it Weeds goes down quite a ways when it it's does. Melt. Okay. But I think it was level with the ground, and uh, they, I think they covered it with some type of a tarp or some kind of a that, tarp, or maybe yeah. brush, uh -huh. just anything to kind of protect from the weather. And so they would stay in this overnight. They would sleep all summer. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets an A for not falling. Well, we still got to cross the street and get it. <laughs> Knock on wood. You made it. You made it. Wow. <laughs> oh, Nelly. Oh, man. <laughs> This is probably one of the most memorial ones. Yeah. <laughs> I know, everybody else, I just sit at a desk. In Potosi, I get to climb. <laughs> okay, so what age groups are going to work or have something to do with this again? Grades. As far as working on the trail, it's high school, 9 through 12. As far as maintaining the trail, that's the environmental club is only for high school. Kids, gotcha. So. Mm -hmm. but, Emily, did you say you were here in third grade? So I got to do that for Tons of interdisciplinary learning. Like the kids get to learn about history, geography, you know, yeah, this year ecology. I'm take my seventh grade classes on a hike there. So awesome. So this would this is called what? What do we call this? This location? Badger, Badger Hut Trail. Badger Hut Trail. And with the idea that it's open to the public, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if people wanted to learn more about it, where would they be able to learn more online? Okay. Or what might be the plan? Um, it's a good question. Am, am I correct that there is a website? No. Or, or is that not true? I'm I don't not, know of any website. It would be under the point. Potosi Historical Society uh -huh. if it was. I'll check into that. Do you have a Chamber of Commerce? We do. Yes, we do. The next stop that we're going to do is uh, the Driftless Information Center. Uh -huh. And that purpose of that will be to let people know that this is here. Ah, I what see. to do in the area. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right. Is it flat land? Yes. yes. <laughs> yep. Oh, good. It's flat. No more hiking. <laughs> cool. All right, so we're off to that location, huh? Yes, we can. We just go up the street, take a left. Do um, you want these guys to be there for that? Or are they... Rural teachers work hard as classroom instructors and community leaders, and here at the Rural Schools Collaborative, we want to celebrate their stories. That's why we partner with the National Rural Education Association to bring you the I Am A Rural Teacher campaign. Read and listen to teacher stories, share your own, or visit our Teach Rural job board to view openings across the country. Visit IamARuralTeacher.org to learn more. I'm a rural teacher. I'm a rural teacher. I am a rural, rural teacher. teacher. The Historical Society really appreciates the kids doing this mm -hmm. because they started this probably maybe 20 years ago or more. And they're kind of at an age now where they, they can't do a lot of that stuff anymore. It's a nice way to help these kids see too why their place matters. I think for years we've talked about how rural is not the greatest place to grow up, but I definitely see a, tr a, a change in that and appreciating and celebrating why living in a rural area is so great. Some of these kids will go into something that's outdoors, whether it's nature, whether it's a game, whether it's forestry, whether it's, you know, um, I think my grandson is thinking about that. We used to go out and cut wood, and he'd say, Grandpa, what is that over there? Look at that. He knows all those little things that I just want to cut wood. <laughs> <laughs> but he would he just really interested in that. Okay, so this is our downtown. You can see we have a lot of empty storefronts. And uh, this is the location oh. now of our Driftless Information Center.
Larry does a great job explaining the significance of connecting students with the local community and history. We've pulled up to the kiosk or the informational center and uh, at this point it's just posts with the roof and the great stuff. The content is coming soon uh, and Superintendent Cohen will explain uh, kind of the layout of the project. So definitely two different projects. One that's been around forever and the kids have kind of taken over some of the roles. Mm -hmm. This obviously something that we're looking to start brand new with the help of the Downtown Revitalization Committee and bring the kids in almost from the very beginning. To, to and, help. To yeah. help out with, yeah. the, with this area. So spatially, okay, so this is downtown Potosi, across from a salon, I would say. Is that a salon? A salon, Western, yeah. Western yeah. Actually across from the old Potosi gym, Potosi High School gym, 1919. Oh my gosh. The old high school gym? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's still people that play basketball there. Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the history here, uh, Jessica, is that this was a Blue Spruce Tavern and Hotel. It was one of the oldest buildings in Potosi. And it fell into private hands and just they just kind of let it go and it just had to be taken down. And so our uh, revitalization committee for the last couple, three years, we've been trying to change the image downtown. It's like we did a, a study with Lafarge and they said you have a beautiful buildings here, the structure, but it's, it's not welcome, it's not friendly. You have to change that if you want people to stop. So we know that there's a lot of traffic through here, but nobody's really stopping because there isn't any place for to stop in. So we thought about doing something and our research told us that if you do something, it has to be close to the downtown. So when people, you want people to stop and if they stop, maybe they will go have lunch or maybe mm -hmm. they'll get gas. So that's the whole theory behind it here. Mm -hmm. So um, we worked a lot with James Snyder. Uh, he's the extension person from Grant County. And so this is going to be called the Potosi Driftless Information Center. Uh, we've learned that in our research that people stop for gas, food, and information. Mm -hmm. And so if they stop here, get some information, maybe they just might stop a while. So that bluff right there, it's, uh, it's, it's just beautiful. It's just right now it's all uh, but there's a lot, of, on top of the hill, there's a lot of rock structures that are here because of the driftless. So this is one piece of it. It's, it we're going to end up with like eight panels, and on those panels will be information about the driftless and also the surrounding area. Uh, and then down below, there'll be places for brochures. Pretty. And there's a, it isn't quite finished. Gary David, uh, he's the guy that, he's a woodworker across from the brewery. He built this, he and his son, and he's got a copper cupola that goes on top. Mm. It's beautiful. Oh, I see. It's all hand space it's where it would go. Top. So that's, that's one of our goals. And then one of our goals is to do something with the village walls, murals. Mm -hmm. um, and we're still kind of working through that. What's we, this built, that building right there? That is a, that's a village hall. Village hall, okay. Village hall. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're thinking that to try to paint something over that would be probably tough mm -hmm. because of the structure so mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at more like a lumen panel that you would attach to the building mm -hmm. and uh so that's there's, there's three different walls and so that's what that's what we're trying to do here uh there's a across over there there's a kind of an old salt shed we're going to remove that this summer and that's going to open that up a little bit mm -hmm. and eventually we want to move a little bit of that rock so that people can access this from around uh, East the other Street side and North mm -hmm. Nice. We got four years to do that. In. Ah, so where did you obtain the funding for what you have done so far? So far, okay. Well, I, I should mention that one of the first things the, the uh, environmental club did is they had a nice bake sale for us. Uh -huh. uh, and Matt, that was at the high school during some event, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the, the skit night for homecoming. Oh, sure. And that was about $700. Uh, we wrote for a legal stole grant mm -hmm. in Platteville, and mm -hmm. that was 6000 Um we have had some donations. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is we, we have a recycling uh, metal uh, going on. And uh, so we've done several projects with the school with that over the years. And now the three of us that do that, um, we, we were nicknamed one time the, the Sanford Boys. Now, if that makes sense, you, you gotta remember there was a program on TV years ago, well, we, they call us the Sanford Boys. It was Mo, Larry, and Cutter. So, we now, in the last year or so, any money that we get from that 
um, scrap metal we donate to this project. It's always got to be a community project. Mm -hmm. So either grant writing or locally sourced funds yes. to build something mm -hmm. for this community yep. Yep. as a means of appreciating this location. Sure. Yeah. And depending on how things go, we have some other plans as well. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have to see how it goes. And it also improves the success of the businesses yeah. that do choose yeah. to reside. Within the last year now, uh, we've had uh, Twisted Vines open up right. across the street. Mm -hmm. uh, the corner drugstore was recently sold, and this was sold. So we're mm -hmm. thinking maybe that there might be starting to think mm -hmm. a little bit about it. Just takes one place to, right. to build, and then it kind of catches on. Exactly. So the kids, mm -hmm. the students, we hope can get involved in this in, mm -hmm. in some. We just we start kind of planning, you know. Right. We don't have a lot of money to hire a big company out of Minneapolis. <laughs> we got to work ourselves. So. But the kids we're hoping will help. It's a grassroots kind of organic, but it. I would like to have it up, on the, up there, put in like one of those native prairies up there. If you get rid of some of those trees mm -hmm. and open that up a little bit, mm -hmm. and have my kids be a part of that. Yeah. Part. We've talked about a scenic overlook up there. Um, if you get up there, you can see all the way to the river, mm -hmm. and oh, wow. uh, mm -hmm. and all of all of downtown area. So it would be a fantastic spot for kind of an overlook. Mm -hmm. um, in my in my mind long range goal uh, i see our while we have a fantastic auditorium at the school i would love to see our kids caroling in this area uh, mm -hmm. during the holiday season uh, and and bring people to the downtown area mm -hmm. i i see our our choirs set up along the walls and and be able to carol down here there's a little bench up there you can't see it for the building but something must have been up there at one time i'm not sure what it was but <laughs> but there's, there's, there's a little bench up there, Jessica. You can see it. It's kind of flat up there. Where am I yeah. looking? Yeah. Just straight ahead. There's a, like a little flat spot. Oh, in the yeah. Hill. Okay, yeah, okay. Hill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before you get to the top. Pardon me? Yeah. Before, mm -hmm. yeah, Before you yeah. get to the top, yeah. The other thing is, in, in the recent, within the last year, the Potosi uh, started a TIF district for housing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that subdivision is just up the hill a little bit. So long term possible goal would be to connect the school with a walking path sure. down to this area and then empty up downtown. It's a great vision. If you live long enough. It's a great vision. <laughs> I can see, you know, you described the caroling with the, the mural behind it, mm -hmm. Christmas lights. I exactly. can see it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, there you go. Thought. So that's, that's kind of what, what we're trying to do. It's a great project and I'm glad to see kids involved in it too. Sure get a vested interest in their, you know, Correct. where they're from. Then That's they, a good group you have, Mr. Eastlick. Yeah, they were always it's a, Yeah. Statistically, you know, our kids go off to school other places, and they might short-term go do other things, but a lot of them come back. They end up coming back. Yeah. Yep. So. It's a great area. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to be away mm -hmm. to appreciate what you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you bring new ideas mm -hmm. back home. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was one of those that moved away. Yeah. For about five years. I lived down in Illinois. By the quad cities, so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My husband did too. We lived for, I mean, he, he moved away for probably 20 years and we came back and I don't think we'd ever, I couldn't get him out of the, well, neither would I. I would never leave the Driftless. Love it. Yeah. Our daughter, Erin, uh, we had two girls and two boys. Uh, she was one that said, I will never move, live to Potosi. I'm going to move away. And uh, so within about six, seven years, she's back in Potosi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's a did graphic you designer. Say a nice try. Yeah. <laughs> she actually did our brochure. We have a brochure that we developed for this project. Mm -hmm. While students are tackling those projects in downtown Potosi, back up on the school property, students are also installing a prairie. Logan, a student at Potosi High School, will tell you all about it. So you've got a project at the school involving prairie restoration or creation. Tell me about that. So we have this basically unused area in the middle of our school school grounds and Mr. Eastlick got approval from the school board to turn that into like a prairie so basically the process that he took was he sprayed it all down with Roundup until all the grass died and now you seeded it this winter. Yep. Well, uh, Ethan helped kind of, Ethan and Logan kind of helped start. You guys worked yeah, we, we started a mix of seeds. Yeah. We had it all set up into different mixes. Yeah. It was just kind of fun. And then 
I went out and seeded it, yeah. So what are what will come up in the spring? <clears throat> so it won't start growing until like June. I see. Or mm -hmm. July because it takes well, the native mm -hmm. seeds have need to have uh, warmer soil temperatures. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we'll probably one of the strategies is you just keep it mowed the first year mm -hmm. to keep out any of the things you don't want growing. And then the second year of summer we would then see stuff popping up. So nice. So native plants to this area. Yep. yep. Very good. Yeah. Uh, it's a good way to use uh, some. You know, unused, untapped kind of land at your school, but still teach with it. Open, yeah, make it open for more mm -hmm. outdoor classroom stuff. So. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. There's no doubt that you could make the claim that all six principles of place-based education are addressed in these three projects. But the one that shines the brightest to me is the idea that we're leveraging the community of Potosi as the classroom. Students are able to network and collaborate with community members that create an educational experience for them, but also benefits the community. It helps our kids establish a sense of pride, connection, and just an understanding of the significance of place. Many thanks go out to Matt Eastlick, Kurt Cohen, Larry Kalina, and the students at Potosi High School. To learn more about Potosi, Wisconsin, place-based education, and the Driftless region of Wisconsin, be sure to look at our show notes. The Proud Rural Teacher Podcast is hosted by me, Jessica Brogley, with the School of Education at the University of wisconsin Platteville. The theme music was created by secondary English education major Simon Yan. The RSC sponsor segment was recorded by elementary education major Maddie Lund. Be sure to subscribe to the PRT Podcast and visit us online at proudruralteacherpodcast.com. And if you have an episode suggestion or feedback, please leave us a speak pipe message on our website. We want to hear your stories. Thanks for listening.